It's taken this son of Swaziland 16 long years to return to his African roots. For all this time, Ikonsonati Gametsi has been living in Israel as an Orthodox Jew and a rabbi. I feel like an embrace of God when I'm at the Western world. It's an amazing feeling. And this is where I feel my spiritual home is. Yet Nati traces his lineage to the once royal Gometsi clan in the kingdom of Swaziland. I feel that sense of royalty. It's more what they call in Yiddish Edelkeit, a certain type of nobility. Now Rabbi Gometsi is bringing his spiritual odyssey full circle. He's finally ready to embrace his African family and his heritage. At Johannesburg International Airport, the homecoming committee is waiting. This is Nati's remarkable story. And I see this pretty young woman running towards me. And then as I look closer, I see it's my sister. Sixteen years. And I look at her, she gives me a big hug. There's nothing you can say, what can you say? It's just raw emotion, raw emotion, emotion at its rawest. For years, Nati has lived as an Orthodox Jew, associating only with other Jews. But now he's returning to his family, many of whom are committed Christians. Nati was exposed to our Christian way of living from a very early childhood, even before he was born. My husband would pray for that child and even some of them give them names that God has given for the path of this child. And Nati's name is Emmanuel, God with us. My birth name is Emmanuel and that Nkosi Nati, which means God is with us in Zulu, is simply a translation from the Hebrew. That to me already seems almost like Hashem had already marked me, God had already marked me as a different child. The Gometsi family worships at the Evangelical Church in Midrand. Nati worshipped with them as a boy. He was uh, very active in the church. He'd go to church every Sunday. We prayed together, would worship together. So he was brought up in a Christian way. I come from a family where people have got pretty strong personalities. My being away from my family has allowed my personality as a Jew to ripen. At first, after my conversion, I was afraid that they would try and, and bring me back to Christianity. And I was determined to keep my Judaism. Gosnati has chosen a lifestyle that is completely different from what I'm used to. He eats different food. He can't do the things that we do. He can't come and worship with us. I can't go and worship in his church. We don't want to be identified with what I would regard as a Jew as a foreign way of worshipping God. Nati's brother, Becky Gometse, is the pastor having also followed a deeply spiritual path. Becky went into the ministry after battling asthma as a child. He believes he was cured by the prayers of his oldest brother, Temba. Having that as a background, then when my grandfather passed away, my mother's father, the Lord spoke to me in an almost audible voice and said to me, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, yes, I'll go. And that's where my preaching ministry began. I feel that each person makes their own decision and we're raised that way to make our own decisions in life and um, I cannot impose upon his choices but um, I just relate to him as my brother and um, I'm happy to see him again that's that's the bottom line as far as how he has chosen to go his path I'm happy for him I'm happy for him but um, it doesn't really change anything that I would believe what I believe and um, the rest, I think, is in the hands of God. The oddest thing that struck me is that he's exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and in one sense, the, the, the tassels and, and all those things, are, I don't see that. I, I see Nati, 
Um, obviously, he's grown up. I mean, 16 years from being, you know, mid 20s to being early 40s is, is, a, is a big change in a person's life. But Nati possibly has changed the least of all of us. Uh, I think what has happened to him has been positive for him. There's no question about it. Uh, it's given him a purpose, perhaps, that he, he didn't have before. It's given him an anchor that perhaps he was lacking before. But he is naughty. If anything like this, where one of them becomes a rabbi, happens in a family, I'm not surprised it happened in my family. It should, there's no, it's the right place for it to happen because we have brought them in the way they should go, not the way we should we go. Now that they've seen me after so many years, they obviously realize that it's not, it would be no go and they're just so happy to have me back as it were. Okay, remain a Jew, remain a Jew, but at least we've got our boy back. And now that he is back, Nati wants to make a pilgrimage to the ancestral family home in the heart of the Swazi Kingdom. The border is the first port of call. How come you from Israel? I haven't seen my father for, for many years. How many years? Sixteen. Ah, sixteen years. Surprise. He's an old man now. It was an experience. Not having been here for 16 years, I sort of wondered whether my, the fact that I'm Israeli is valid. And I said, no, you're one of ours, sort of half expecting to be kidnapped. And then the person behind there thought he knew he was speaking Hebrew, but in fact, he was speaking Arabic. So he thought he was like saying Shalom, but he said, Salam Aleikum. And I answered back in Arabic as well, Aleikum Salam. The first stop on the homecoming journey is the village in southern Swaziland where Nati was born. His family and father are waiting. What is like a dream? It's a dream come true. Oh, you It's a big thing for me, after 16 years, to see my family. What I can say is, that means in Hebrew, I bless you in the name of God. But the joy of reconnecting with family and dad, who's now in his 80s, touches a raw nerve. And I just want to ask my father for forgiveness that I didn't speak to him in such a long time. I'm really sorry, Dad. When a person becomes a Jew, they change their name. And sometimes they change their last name. And so people have asked me, how about you? I said, no, my name is Gametz. <laughs> I said, that's going to stay Gametz. You know, and many people, they change it to an Israeli name. But I always been very proud about Gametz's history. So th these are my roots that you see in front of you. And those roots are not only centuries-old Swazi, but also deeply Christian. They go back to Nati's grandfather, a prominent preacher and evangelist. This is a church in Klosheni where my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, was a preacher. And people from the neighboring homesteads would come and listen to him preach every Sunday. And my dad grew up in one of the houses that are in this particular little village that we see. An Orthodox Jew travelling in a non-Jewish country faces certain challenges. Nati now eats only the strictly kosher meals he's brought along. The villagers are baffled by this Swazi-speaking man as he offers the traditional Jewish blessing over the washing of hands and the breaking of bread. So what happens is that a Jew, before he eats bread, he washes his hands and then he says a blessing on the washing of the hands. Before he takes a bite of the bread, he makes another blessing. The journey takes Nati off the beaten track 
and far from any other Jewish people, but he adheres strictly to the obligations of prayer three times a day. With the sun about to set, he finds a secluded spot. Praying three times a day is a way of focusing on the most important things in life. It's very powerful in showing a human being that they have to be constantly connected with the Creator, regardless of what the demands of their day-to-day -day lives may be. The ancestral home of the vast Gemetsi clan is Sifo Faneni. The Gemetsis arrived from East Central Africa in the 17th century. As the first immigrants, the Gemetsis were once esteemed as a royal lineage. Later they were defeated by the more powerful Dlamini clan. Nati's great-grandfather chose to abdicate to become a preacher, which ended any future princely aspirations. My father belonged to the royal family of the Gemetsis, traditionally as the one that qualified to the throne of the clan, but uh, he declined because of the religious calling. He was called to be a pastor of the evangelical church. I describe myself of princely origin because as my dad said, my grandfather abdicated for Christian reasons. And that's why, as you've heard my dad go back and forth from talking about chief and king, is because that, there's still that feeling within ourselves as Gametzis and our, our people of that royal lineage. Aaron Gametzi was Swaziland's former education minister. But it was the age-old royal connections which helped forge a special bond with the late King Zopuza. My father used to go to His Majesty the late King many times to consult on various issues. He could come and go as he pleased. As he said, he, one of his positions he occupied was the liaison officer of the King, which in Siswati they call that Liso Lingos, which is the eye of the King. And that's a very close position. Driving through Mbaban, the capital, triggers strong memories. Here, the Gametsi family's home was owned by the King. It's also where Nati went to school. This is the St. Mark's School uniform. One thing that's changed is that the children are speaking Siswat. Usually the children of St. Mark's would be English-speaking children, even the black kids. And that's why one of the reasons why I was brought up speaking English was so I'd be able to attend school. At a time when education was racially segregated in neighbouring South Africa, Waterford High was a shining example of multi-racial schooling. Nati has not been back since he graduated more than 20 years ago. Welcome back. Thank you very much. Are you the headmaster? Yes, I am. I'm Lawrence, Lawrence Nodder. Lawrence, Lawrence Nodder. Come you, through. Did you know? Thank you. Come through. I now live in Israel. And um, this is an un unusual, unusual combi combination. Unusual yes. combination. Yes. My memories of Waterford are all favourable memories. These were my formative years when my, my changing start, my thinking started to become more adult. In fact, the acumen that I had for languages became very apparent right here at Waterford Gumflaba School. Nati is fluent in 12 languages and today he gets a chance to practice his French. <laughs> the influence that I got from here helped me to resist perhaps more negative elements of apartheid and that I didn't have strong feelings of hatred towards white people and all that, because I lived together with people of different colors. And I knew that we were all one and, and that we should all appreciate and learn from each other. When Nati finished high school, he continued his studies over the border in apartheid-era South Africa. In the early 80s, he enrolled in languages at Wits University in Johannesburg. His flair for languages would begin to change his life's course. Being a black student at, the, at Wits during the early 80s felt like uh, walking a tightrope. At the same time, you're grateful for being able to learn at a respectable institute of higher learning. 
On the other hand, you still feel a sense of oppression. And especially during my first year when I was living in Soweto, in Dube, you know, here you are almost treated as an honorary white, and then going back on a train to smoky uh, locations in Soweto. And most black people didn't live on the campuses here. When I first arrived at the campuses, it was almost like a test situation. It hadn't been done before. Today, in post-apartheid South Africa, this situation has changed, but it's still rare for a non-Jew to study Hebrew and to join the Jewish fraternity on campus. My studying of Hebrew happened by chance, actually, because I was studying French, German, Italian. And I was sitting in the middle of an Italian class, and as when people are bored, they look around and, you know, see what other people are doing. And I saw someone sitting next to me on my right, who was writing backwards, who was writing from right to left. And I was very intrigued with the script and what he was doing. So I asked him after class, what was that? And he said, oh, I was doing my Hebrew homework. I actually thought of it as more for egotistical reasons, because I said, imagine if I could learn this language and even write differently, that would be great for my ego and everything. So I decided that I'd go to the Hebrew department and see if I could enroll. So I enrolled to study Hebrew, as simple as that. And that was also the beginning of close friendships with uh, Jewish students. And, and that's where I got more friendly with the Jewish people. It's indescribable how they helped me. And they helped me feel at home with Jewish customs. You know, I walked into their home on the Shabbos and they give me a yarmulke to put on my head. I really felt very much accepted. And if it wasn't for my link with Jewish South Africans, I really don't think I would have become a Jew. Given this gratitude to Jewish South Africans, Nati agrees to share his life story with a gathering of Johannesburg businessmen. And my long years spent in yeshiva, I never forgot that this is really where the Jewish story of my life began. I personally happened to be the campus chaplain in those years, and that's how I actually got to know Nati and his friends. Here you had this uh, young black man that was studying Hebrew, could speak Hebrew far better than most, most Jews, uh, had an understanding of Hebrew on the level even of a rabbi. And he was highly intelligent, uh, very questioning, and uh, to be absolutely honest, it was like a pleasure, it was a treat whenever we personally could have the Nati over at our house because he just added the special touch and the special meaning to what it means to be alive, what it means to be Jewish, and what it means to be a human being. I heard about you too. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. It's great to meet you. It was still very uncommon for white people to entertain and uh, to have black people in their home. And Nati made it quite clear that these people did not see him as a color difference. And that's what I think is quite interesting, that these people that had befriended him, in a sense, were defying the system. One of those who defied the apartheid system is Arie Levine. How's everything going? Who, like Nati, also now lives in Israel. When I met Nati Edwitz, he was becoming interested in, in Judaism, and that, that helped me with my Judaism because his interest influenced me to start um, looking at Judaism from a different perspective. He took me to the library, he showed me different books on different aspects of Judaism that I hadn't yet encountered uh, in the day school system. Okay, you can be pushed for ages. Nati was an unusual phenomenon in the fact that he wanted to become Jewish, and though he was warmly welcomed by a social group of Jews, in, especially in the residence and at university, I think he probably encountered a lot of antagonism from non-Jewish components at the university. <laughs> he was entering a group that he didn't belong to. And uh, in apartheid South Africa, I think that it wasn't the done thing. And I basically rode the wave of certain opposition from black elements that I was associated with white people because I felt that I really had something in common with the Jews and that it was a natural thing. It wasn't like I was trying to push an agenda or anything. But in the end, it was, it was like living two contradictory lives. In the end, I go back to where I live and they go back to where they live. 
and the apartheid situation re-entrenches itself. But I was determined, as we know from my background in Waterford, I knew that this wasn't how life should be and that life could be different, that people could live together in harmony without race being such a big issue. And so I used that as ammunition to help me fight against apartheid, if you could say that, in my own private way. Despite these racial pressures, Nati was becoming an outstanding Hebrew scholar, graduating to the top of the class. But Nati was yearning for something more. He would find it within the ancient biblical texts. When Judaism, if you want, really got hold of me, was when I started learning in the language laboratory sessions. So there was this like Yemenite music in the background, you know, very oriental, reminiscent of camels in the desert, etc. And then all of a sudden, through the, through the tape, I hear the following words. Those words hit me in such a powerful way. I said to myself, what is it with this Hebrew? What's going on over here? And I felt it drawing me inside of it. And I wanted to be a part of what I felt because I felt a sense of identity with this inner me message which was coming out of the language. It was as if the traditional ram's horn, the shofar, was calling Nati to a new spiritual location. I remember I was sitting down in this, the uh, concourse having a cup of coffee. And as I recall, I was reading Haaretz, which is a Hebrew paper. In walks a gentleman and starts speaking to me in Hebrew. And he said, I see that you are in the Hebrew department and that you got high marks there. Why did you stop? And then the person talking to me introduced himself, Professor Moshe Sharon. And he asked me if I would be interested in doing a PhD at the Hebrew University in Yerushalayim. I was a bit astounded at that. But there was something when I felt I had an opportunity to go to Israel. And I'm so enthralled with the Jewish people, I, I knew that I couldn't turn this opportunity down. I felt it would have a much greater impact on my life. And as we see today, that is what actually took place. That opportunity would take him to a world far removed from his African roots. I simply took an LR flight out to Israel and uh, began my studies at the university. Here, Nati Gametsi would find his soul, and it would be Jewish. What made me give up my Hebrew studies at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem was my realizing that I was actually more attracted to the, the religious side of the language. I was previously unaware that it was Judaism that I was seeking. I thought it was something special in the language itself that I was looking for. It's only when friends of mine came to study at a yeshiva, a rabbinical college in Jerusalem, that I realized that my whole attraction to Hebrew was really about Judaism and my attraction to Judaism as a faith. Nati enrolled at the same rabbinic college as his friends. But unlike the other Jewish-born students who were returning to their roots, Nati was choosing to become a Jew. In those early days, Rabbi Kantrovitz was one of his teachers. I first got to know Nati around 1995 when I started teaching in Orsameach. And Nati was one of the advanced students in the study hall. A lot of people are returning to Judaism even if they don't you know, know what Judaism is exactly. They're going back to something that they feel this is what they were and they want to know about it. And Nati was choosing to be a Jew because he, as he described to me so beautifully, he saw the MS, he saw the, the truth in it, and he saw the, the, the beauty in it, and he wanted to explore it. When uh, Nati uh, came to me in my classes, I, at the time, didn't take notice at all of the fact that he was black. Reason is that I come from a country, Holland, Amsterdam, where it didn't make any difference the color of somebody's skin. It's a very liberal country, so it didn't really 
make any difference to me and it didn't make any impression on me as such. He became something of a challenge to us all and that is that he suddenly made us aware about whom we were. He was looking to become Jewish and he was on his way, which I don't think was a very easy way for him at the time. I think it was a way of crisis as well. There's somebody coming from a very different world. Uh, first of all, from uh, the black world into the white world. And secondly, from one religion into a very different kind of religion, that is the Jewish uh, tradition. Even though I come from a, a very Christian home, I never, I never myself entertained Christianity as a possibility, or any other religion for that matter. I immediately zoomed in on Judaism to when I came across the, the binding of Isaac, that text. And I felt it was telling me something about my inner self. And so my attraction to Judaism is, is more a journey into the self, more than entertaining something that's on the outside. I'm not sure who learned more from whom, to be quite honest. No doubt he learned a lot from me, but the identity of the Jewish people uh, was something where perhaps I learned more from him, because he was somebody really searching for it and trying to find out what it meant to be Jewish. Also to try out to find out what it means to be religious in the Jewish sense of the word, which is complicated and uh, requires not just a lot of knowledge, but also a lot of uh, soul searching. That soul-searching would bring its own inner turmoil and a yearning to belong. Nati shares these thoughts with a group of Johannesburg businessmen. Every time I saw people with yarmulkes, I wanted to be part of what they were doing. I just couldn't get into that world. And I realized it's because I'm not, I'm not a Jew. So what happened was that when I was in Jerusalem, I decided, look, you know what your problem is? You're surrounded by Jews in all places. Whether you're at the university, at, at, at the Hebrew University, there's Yidin over there. Whether you're attending a, a lecture at Osamer, it's all Yidin. I said, you know what you have to do? You have to run away from this Jewish world. I said, go to a place where there's lots of non-Jews and in, become integrated because you yourself are a non-Jew. So I decided what I'd do is that when there was a break from university, I'd go to uh, Italy. There's this street in Rome, which is just off St. Peter's, called La Strada dell'Immacolata Concezione, which means the street of immaculate conception. I said, wow, this is really Christian over here. <laughs> I've really left the Yidden behind now. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you where the changing point came, where it became far too much for me to bear. One day, I came down for breakfast, and there I was with this food, and I picked up my fork to eat the food, and I didn't put it into my mouth. I put the fork back down. I, being a cynic, said to myself, what's your problem, Nati? The food's not kosher. Investigating further, Nati made the alarming discovery that it was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and a fast day when all food is forbidden. There and then, he made the decision to return to Israel and to change his life. He would convert to Judaism. Like all converts, he would have to appear before the Jewish court, or Beth Din. When my date came, I had stood before the judges, and they asked me, don't you know that Jewish people suffer? It's a difficult thing, and uh, this and that. Why do you want to become a Jew? I'm sure that there are people here that think I'm a Meshuggah as well. Right? <laughs> let's, let's talk, uh, you know, what's this guy doing? He doesn't have enough Taurus in his life. <laughs> No, I'm black and Jewish. No. I said, Do you really want to know why I want to become a Jew? And I told them in these words, Va'ani kirvas elokim litov, which means, for me, closeness to God is good. That's why I'm here. And they had no answer. At once, Nati was accepted as a Jew. It was three years after he first arrived in Israel. But in general, Judaism is a faith that does not look for converts. The reason why the Jewish tradition does not ask uh, other people to become Jewish is because it believes that there is no need for it since everybody is a child of God and different people have different obligations in relationship to God. 
the Jewish tradition accepts the Gentile world uh, for their uh, contribution, also religious contribution they make to this world and their relationship to God. But if you want to join us, then you have the option to do so. But, but we only want to accept that person for the condition that we know for sure that the person is absolutely genuine about it and authentic about it, like in the case of Nati. And then we are not allowed to put any obstacles in the way. For Nati, conversion was only the beginning. His real goal was to become a rabbi. He was determined to be part of the spiritual and learned world of the Orthodox Jew. That would mean many more years of full-time, intensive study. He is basically the jewel of that place. But once he leaves, the Yotzo Misham Panas. He would also need a suitable study partner, like Tzvi Maoz. I never quite understood of Nati's journey coming from a called darkest Africa, never being there in South Africa, and make his journey through uh, Judaism. I never did understand it. I never questioned it. I figured he's doing his thing, everybody else is doing their own. And uh, after a while, you see a lot of things which are out of the, out of the norm, which wind up being ordinary. After eight years of learning in Israel, Nati would be awarded the title of rabbi in recognition of his wisdom, scholarship and teaching ability. As a study partner, Nati was a different experience for me. Because Nati had a quite a depth, quite a depth of understanding, uh, as if he had a, a Yiddish neshama, another a Jewish soul speaking out of him. And with enormous depth, he had uh, enormous command of languages, which is part of his, his early studies as far as Yiddish was concerned, as far as English was concerned, which made the learning all that much uh, more interesting, more looking forward. Soon after their study sessions began, Nati became part of the Maoz family. The South African Jews are very open. Mm -hmm. Nati's a year older than uh, my middle son, which means he fits in just fine in the age of, of all the our children. And uh, I've always enjoyed him so much. The clear thinking, the honest thinking, the depth, the genuineness of it. He has no idea the little things I've learned just from listening when he would answer quietly, self-disciplined, not uptight. And the um, awesome thing about a convert is that they come into faith with genuine believing, not accepting what someone's told them. Nati Gometsi's flair for languages and his ability as a translator were soon recognized by established scholars. One of my first books I published uh, was edited by him. His English was outstanding. We went through many of the essays, which later were published in this uh, book, which is called Between Silence and Speech. He has a tremendous feeling for language, uh, which also draw him to the rabbinic literature. Uh, normally, to study rabbinical text is not just knowing modern Hebrew. You have to understand the classical language, the expression. And he picked this up very, very quickly, which was impressive. I haven't seen this actually anybody else doing as quickly as, uh, as he did. Finding a wife became Nati's next challenge. Ultra-Orthodox Jews are expected to marry and create a family. Before I became Jewish, I never really thought I would get married. After I became Jewish and realized that it is an obligation, I was just wondering how God would bring about my other half. In the ultra-Orthodox Jewish world, Dating has nothing to do with the boy meets girl scenario. It's limited to the search for a marriage partner, and that's the role of the matchmaker. Nati's wife Shana recalls how it happened. She said, Would you ever think about going on a shidduch with a ger, a non Jew that had converted? And I said, I was shocked at the question. I said, Well, I never really thought of that, but if they're midos, if they're personality and they were kind, then, then why not? And then she said, and what about a black convert? So I looked at her and I said, wait a minute. 
This is highly unusual. <clears throat> Do you have someone in mind? And three months later, Shana and Nati were married. Because Nati's parents couldn't make it from Africa for the wedding, the couple asked Svi and Sora Mayoz to act in their stead. And then Nati said, would we be as though his parents, I really don't like the word surrogate parents, it's, would we be his parents for the, for the wedding? We felt tremendously honoured. Creating a family is regarded as a holy and blessed act of a Jewish married couple. There's always an obligation in Judaism to reproduce. Having adopted our children, there's also an opinion that through adoption of children you can also fulfill the commandment of, of being fruitful and multiply. I very much enjoy being a wife. And I know, like, coming from America, it's like the worst thing you can say, probably, oh, I just like being a wife and a mother. And, but it's, it's something maybe I ran away from a large part of my life, but, like, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. And, like, raising a Jewish family and having a, a Jewish husband that, that teaches, it's a rabbi, and I'm just so incredibly proud of him. And so it's, it's a wonderful thing to be, to be married to someone that you're extraordinarily proud of. After their marriage, the couple settled in Tzfat, in the northern Galilee, to raise their family. Tzfat is one of the four holy cities of Israel. The mystical tradition of Judaism, the Kabbalah, originated here, and the town has become home to many with a spiritual inclination. There's something in the air. There's something which is conducive to contemplation. I don't know of any other place in the world where I I feel as contemplative as I do here. And I think it, it, it gives itself to a person uh, looking at their life as a whole and assessing how far they think they've traveled and, and on, on their spiritual journey and what still has to be done. So I see it as a, a place for great reflection. The evil inclination and the deficiencies that we have are there in order that a person should be able to acquire their own perfection. As a rabbi, Nati teaches various aspects of the Torah, or Jewish scriptures. The Shori Bina Girls Seminary in Sfat caters mainly for Americans from non-religious backgrounds. The one-year program appeals to girls who've had little exposure to spiritual matters. These girls did not grow up in high school with teachers like him. So yes, it adds a dimension. On the other hand, it's not because he's black, and it's not because he was a prince. It's not because he's a different, coming from a different place. It's who he is, it's, it's who, it's the way he thinks and the way he's developed his thinking and the way he can give over in the classroom certain concepts that even if he was white and born in Borough Park, wherever he was, you know, it's not, it's not an external thing, it's a very deep thing that makes him so profoundly effective. Creation was not created perfect because it, it, it needed man to work on it and do the mitzvahs in order to bring godliness into the world. I've had girls who, at the end of the year, have said that Rabbi Gamedza is the one who's made such an effect on them, that they've found themselves, they've deepened their relationship with God, they've, they just feel so much more stable now. Nati also runs classes for women in the community. Adina Rosen is one of his students. I met uh, Rav Nati some years back when he first came to Tzfat and I, did, I heard through the grapevine that there was a very special teacher in town. And I started to attend class. He had a class in the evening for women on the tour portion of the week. And I found, ah, this is it. This is the amazing teacher I've been waiting for. We started a class at my house called Tikkun, which is uh, in English say rectification, but it's much more than that. It's like understanding your purpose in the creation in the world, how you, why you're here in order to help heal the planet. And uh, it's something that's very unusual. It's, I could say very easily that there's not a lot of teachers so openly and fully and exuberantly teaching this. And so I feel very, very blessed.
rabbi has a lifelong commitment to daily prayer and study within a community of Jewish men. Nati Gometsi is a long-time member of Rabbi Weingott's synagogue. He's often asked to give talks on Sabbath mornings. And a lot of the times I was sure that it was stuff that he had uh, almost extemporaneously uh, made up on the spot. And some of the stuff was quite brilliant. Even in the way he expresses himself, using certain terms from Jewish law to express philosophical ideas are unique to him. I've met other converts. And I think it, that his, uh, his insights and his, uh, his vision of Judaism is quite exceptional. To compare Nati to other black Jews does justice to neither. Over the past few decades, Israel has taken in thousands of Ethiopian Jews who consider themselves descendants of Dan, one of the lost tribes of Israel. Nati, on the other hand, is a convert. His African origins are not connected to the ancient history of the Jewish people. It's a challenge for him to go into the religious Israeli society, which is composed mostly of white people. It takes a lot of courage, and he realizes he'd have to leave behind uh, you know, his past life. He'd have, have to go on a new path where he, where he basically would be alone. Because the baby was coughing, that if you cut an onion in half... Sometimes being a mixed couple can be very painful even here in Israel, where it could be that we're more accepted than anywhere else maybe in the world. We realize that rather than look at it that as a racist or prejudiced, just that it's just something so different that sometimes there are giggles and laughs. And so we just, we just say, okay, Hashem. So, so we're teaching the Jews about who really is a Jew. Israelis today and already for a long time, they struggle a lot with their identity. Uh, am I a Jew? Am I Israeli? What does this mean in religious terms? What does it mean in national terms? And they are surprised when they suddenly hear that somebody so far away from anything Jewish makes this move. And I know about cases where people would say, uh, well, if that's what he did, then there must be much more to being Jewish than I'm aware of. And in that sense of the word, Nati's uh, story can be of tremendous inspiration to other people. Nati has also struggled with his own identity, who he is, and where he fits in. I think being the only black Jew probably in South Africa made me feel a bit strange in that black people in gen general, they have this brotherhood type of thing. When they see a fellow black person, they greet him or they, they have a kind of brotherhood. And I, I could feel that I was being checked out by quite a few of the black people to see whether I was still a brother or, you know. I don't know whether one can still be a brother and a Jew, but I could see that they were trying to feel out whether that kinship of being black was still there. And the truth of the matter is that it is still there. During Nati's homecoming visit to Royal Swaziland and South Africa, he was hosted by several communities, including one headed by Rabbi Michael Katz. Okay, so let's, uh, I just want to show you around here. The uh, fact that it's probably the first time that a black rabbi or a black rabbinic figure has addressed anybody in South Africa, has uh, spoken in a shul, has given shiurim, has given uh, Torah classes and so on. Um, it's been an absolutely captivating uh, experience for everybody. But I think that people have identified with the way he's presented it, with the story that he's told, which has been so moving. Um, people have told me that after he spoke on Friday night that um, they weren't able to sleep out of a feeling of just what this man had to go through in order to be Jewish. And that's really what I came to share with you today, is a part of my soul. Has it really been worth it? The question is one which is asked in my mind, but for which I, have a, I always have a response to. And that, of course, it's worth it, because it's a matter of what is true versus what is not true, and at least from my perspective. And so, therefore, whatever the price is in such a situation, it's always worth paying. Sixteen years away from home means the Israeli and African families hardly know each other. But family is family. I love him 
whether he is a rabbi or whether he is a Christian, uh, you know, pastor, as far as I'm concerned, as my son, I will love him. Nati's voyage of the Spirit started in Swaziland. It skipped from a love of the Hebrew language at university to choosing the Jewish faith. Now in Israel, he's immersed himself in the life of a rabbi. He was worried about so many things, so many terrible things that he thought were going to happen. And every one of them did happen. And yet he's still here to tell the story as a Jew. He still managed to, to go through with the conversion. He managed to, to triumph and he managed to get to where he is, which is awesome. It's called a leap of faith, and it's a leap across a chasm that I would not want to have to do. I feel that I've had to pay a very heavy price for being Jewish, but it's one which I feel is, is part, of, part and parcel of being a Jew. As an all or nothing situation, every bit of it has been worthwhile.